Indeed, let us pray. Over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at a very specific verse that us as Southern Baptists and really Christians should examine. Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, where Jesus is sending his disciples out by twos and telling them the harvest is wide, but we need laborers. So within the next couple of weeks, we're going to embark on this Luke uh, 10, 2 venturing. Again, like I said, we're going to open up the sanctuary at 10.02 a.m. and p.m. on October the 2nd to pray specifically for laborers that would raise up amongst us, among us and pray, at least to pray. The very foundational thing that us as a church can do is, is to pray. So this morning's sermon is entitled, Let Us Pray. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Psalms in chapter 32. Our primary examination this morning will be found in the first six verses therein. Luke 2 and 10 and 2 says this, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. And pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Now, if you recall, the context of this is Jesus gathered some uh, apostles or disciples to go out and to pray. And so he sent them out by twos. There was a moment in time he said, well, if they would not re receive you into their house to shake the dust off as a testament and a testimony uh, among, uh, against them. But there is a very significant thing that us as a church can begin to, to focus in on our prayer life. So today's sermon is more or less what we might think of as prerequisites to effective prayer. Some things that must be play in place in our lives and as a church body that would allow us to have an effective prayer life. Now, if we're going to pr effectively pray for the harvest, then there must be some things in place individually and as a church. If we want to be what we would call prayer warriors for the harvest and for the laborers, there need to be some things in place. And so as we look at Psalm, we're going to see a progression that David is going to lay out in reference to iniquity, to sin, to guile, to transgression. He's going to lay four specific words out, uh, out for us, out for his readers to examine and to say, well, these are things that are offensive to God. And as we look at those things that are offensive to God, then we need to react positively to those and confess. And then we'll understand that we can, by only being covered by Christ Jesus, can we live a life that is effective in prayer. In the spirit of keeping the psalm intact, I have looked at a poem entitled, Traveled on Your Knees. Us today, we can travel on our knees. We might not be missionaries that can go out. We might not be able to pick up and just and go out into the world. Makes me think of this poem called, entitled, Travel on Your Knees. We all can do this. Last night, I took a journey to a land far across the sea. I didn't go by a boat or a plane. I trusted on my knees. I saw so many people there in, in deepest depths of sin. And Jesus told me that I should go and that there were souls to win. But I said, Jesus, I can't go and work with such as these. He answered very quickly, yes, you can by traveling on your knees. He said, you pray and I'll meet the need. You call and I will hear, be concerned about the lost souls of both those far and near. Remember last week we talked very briefly about having a burden for someone we never laid our eyes on. Have a burden for the lost where, uh, that we have never laid our eyes on these people and yet we have a burden for those lost souls. The poem continues and reads, And so I tried it. I knelt in prayer. I gave up some hours of ease. I felt the Lord right by my side while traveling on my knees. As I prayed on and saw souls saved 
and twisted bodies healed and saw God's workers strength renewed while laboring on the field. And I've heard time after time missionaries come back from the field and they would say they got a, re, a, a rejuvenation, a refreshing by going out and serving and, and, and sharing the gospel with those uh, that have never heard it before. There's a refreshing about some, there is something refreshing about gathering with the saints and just basically praying for those that are lost. At the very least, us as a church body should at least be praying for those in the world. We might not all be able to get up and go. But one thing we can do is travel on our knees, as this poem says. I said, yes, Lord, I have a job, my desire, thy will to please. I can go and heed thy call by traveling on my knees. This is something every one of us can do. Every one of us can gather in prayer. Because what happens is when we have our hearts turned towards God's mission, there will be some that say, I must go. There will be some that rise up and say, I must go. I will go. So it's very foundational and important for us to understand that we can travel on our knees, and by traveling on our knees in prayer, it will call some up to go into the uttermost parts of the world. James 5 and verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So in our time of examining prayer today in the book of Psalms, I want us to pay attention very specifically to this phrase, of a righteous man. Of a righteous man. As we looked at James, the righteous man's prayer availeth much. And now that speaks something to us. That means there are some things that must be in place for us to have an effective prayer life. And we're going to look, we're going to look at these by examining Psalm 32 this morning, a Psalm of David. Before we get into the reading of this particular text this morning, would you pray with me and ask that the Lord would enlighten us by His Holy Spirit and work on hearts and minds and transform us to the image of the Son. Let's pray. Father, thank You today that You have granted us another day to come into Your house. And we do ask You that You would begin to work in our hearts, work in our minds, turn us towards a, a, having a worshipful state. Help us to have a worshipful attitude. Help us to have a worshipful prayer life. Help us to have our minds on you. We ask you, God, if we have come into your house with anything other than worshiping you and hearing from heaven, we ask you, God, right now, we will begin to cast those things out as you enable us to do that by your divine and Holy Spirit. We ask you today, God, that you would help us, God, to travel on our knees. Help us today, God, to pray for your glory. And pray that the laborers will come and rise up among us and go out because the fields are white. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you love Jesus, say amen. He is wonderful. The first thing I want us to look at as we travel through this psalm is there must be a level of forgiveness. There has to be forgiveness. So praying for the harvest involves forgiveness. This is really in God's economy all the way through. Anything we do for God and to be effective involves forgiveness. But we want to zero in on a prayer life. We want to zero in on us as, as prayer, what we might call prayer warriors. So beginning with verse 1, a psalm of David, Mashil, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. So we see automatically there's a, trans, um, there's a transpiring of some words here at the very opening of these two verses that we want to look at as regard, in regards to us being forgiven in, eye, in the eyes of God. So this is what we would call an instructive poem. We might call this a didactic poem. We call this one that gives us some instruction. We can also say that this is a poem of lament. What is the lament? David is lamenting and reflecting on his sin. We should lament when we are an offense to God. We should be utterly broken when we have offended God. And so there is four words in this particular first two verses that, uh, that David really brings out for us. It's a poem that teaches us. It's a poem that is instructive 
for us. And it is a poem that is a lament. I think when we hear the phrase that David was God's own heart, this is what it meant, that he was broken, he knew how to be contrite before God. Now David was a human being just like we all were. He slipped, he fell, he sinned, but what he did know was how to fall before his face before God. He knew how to be contrite before God. This is what made David a man of the God's own heart. There are four words used in regards to opposition to God being in opposition to God, which is all-inclusive of what sin is in and of itself. Sin can encompass all of these things. So we're going to look at this as we go through the psalm. Number one, transgression is a term that denotes one that has passed over into a territory or into a place where they should not go. You've heard the, the scripture, you were dead in your trespasses in sin. You've gone somewhere that was not in God's original path for you. You've gone off of that path. You have gone out of God's original will for your life. And that is to be holy as he is holy and live up to God's holy standard. So the transgression is we have gone into prohibited territory, a place where we should not and where, uh, where we were not originally made to go. And then he uses the word sin. We're all familiar with the word sin, but then in this particular case, sin in this particular usage of the word is an archery term as one that misses the mark on the field of archery. They have a particular target, they rear back, they let it go, but yet they miss the mark. Now Paul is going to use this over in the book of Philippians uh, to describe one in the Olympic Games, one that would be a runner and that would miss the mark, miss, miss the finish line. When we sin, we miss the mark of God's expected holiness. He says, be holy as I am holy. And yet when we miss the mark in sin, we miss that altogether. So not only is it a specifically an archery term in this sense, in the New Testament, Paul uses this illustration of, the, of missing the mark much like a, an Olympic runner. We're all familiar. We might have watched the Olympic Games, so we might see a runner out on the field. He has spent his whole life conditioning for this one moment in history. Every four years might come around, and he has conditioned his body so that he is a runner. I mean, he spent his whole life. He's ate his Wheaties. He's drank his protein shakes. He has ran his laps. He has built his body. He's built his muscles, and it shows. He gets out on the field, in track and field, he begins to run. He begins to run with all he's got. You look at this runner, his face, his muscles, every muscle in his body is exerted because he has a certain goal to reach. He has a finish line to reach. And so much like this, Paul is writing of the Olympic runner, the Olympic game, where one has trained their body to have a specific goal in mind. And by missing that mark, they miss the finish line. God's holiness is that finish line. When we have sinned, we miss that mark all the way. No matter how hard we exert no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we've conditioned ourselves to meet, meet that mark of holiness, we will fail. We will totally miss that mark. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so Philippians 3.14, I press toward the mark for the prize for the high, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So no matter how hard we try to reach that mark, we will miss it. We will miss it without Christ. Iniquity is much like the trespassing, but one that has gone off the beaten path, one has gone off the original course in which they were created, or one that has turned from a proper course of action, which would be that we are to be holy as God is holy. And so much like trespassing or transgression, iniquity is much the same. Anything that is morally, spiritually grotesque, and sin it is ugly, sin is grotesque, sin is brutal. It distorts everything. It distorts everything in this life. It touches every facet of life. It touches our families. It touches everything. And then guile denotes deception or fraudulence. We might be more familiar when it speaks of Jesus Christ in the King James that says there was no guile found in him. Speaking of Jesus, there was no deceit found in him. There was no fraudulence. So guile denotes deception or fraudulence. All of this really boils down to what all the encompassing effects of sin. Now David also uses a word to cover and that denotes 
the sacrificial system. It denotes sin. It, it denotes to atone for sin or to cover. In today's term, we would not necessarily use the word cover as much as we would, in your Bibles, use the word propitiation. Or as we might say, expiation. And those are all biblical terms. Those aren't big fancy words. Expiation, propitiation. We might say atonement through Jesus Christ. So we might not use the word covered, but we would use propitiation. We would use those terms more than anything. Blessed is the one that knows without a shadow of doubt that they are justified in the eyes of God and not in and of themselves. We can't justify, we can't justify ourselves. We all fall short of that without Jesus Christ. Not that our works or any works that we do will ever satisfy God. Again, we are like the Olympic runner. No matter how hard we run, we will never, we will never hit the mark without the Lord Jesus in our lives. No matter how hard we run, no matter how much we train ourselves, we will never reach that. If we are to pray for the harvest, if you and I are to pray for laborers in the harvest, we must have a clear and clean conscience before, before God. And the reality is if we have sin in our lives and we pray for one another, there's really two avenues of a prayer life that is exhibited. When one that is harboring sin and sin is festering in their lives, there are two ways in which that person prays. And I would have to say they aren't really praying to the Lord at all. When one is harboring sin, they might pray. They say, well, let me pray for something. And they wind up praying selfishly. They wind up praying for things that they would want to consume all themselves. Or they wind up praying for things that they pray for amiss or out of the will of God. When they are in sin, they would pray for things that are selfish. When they are in sin, the other thing would be that they pray a very judgmental prayer. When one is in sin, they pray a very judgmental prayer. Like the Pharisees that said, thank the Lord I'm not like this guy here. Thank you, Jesus, that I'm not like him. When we have sin in our life, we wind up praying very judgmental. Lord, I don't want to be like this person. I don't want to be like them. Thank the Lord I'm not like them. We lose all humility. We lose all sense of grace, the grace of God. We lose the sense of God's mercy. And really, quite frankly, we don't understand God himself. When there is sin, we pray very selfishly or judgmental. A prayer that does not focus on God's big storyline. It doesn't focus on God's grand story. Number two, praying for the harvest involves happiness. You know that we're not guaranteed happiness in this life. You and I are not guaranteed that we're going to be happy. I will say this, that we are guaranteed that we will be joyful in the Lord. We do have that guarantee. If we are in Jesus Christ, we have that we, want, well, we might not be happy all the time. But we can have joy and we can have contentment in this life. Why? Because we know that we have been redeemed. We know that we have been forgiven. I want you to notice what David says about harboring sin and letting sin fester in one's life. I want you to notice what he says. What happens both physically and most important spiritually. What happens to the inner man that harbors sin? When I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. There he ends his moment of prayer. Now David is reflecting on sin in his life. He is reflecting in his sin. And in Psalm 51, it, David makes the, uh, he makes the proclamation that his sin is ever before him. He's reminded of his sin continually. He doesn't try to hide uh, his sin. Although he did initially, what made God's own heart is that he understood he was in sin. So here he is acknowledging his sin uh, before the Lord. He is reflecting on sin in his own life. Now we are not informed as to what this particular sin would be in David's life. We're not informed. We're not given the, uh, what this particular sin he is lamenting over is. But a, a good indication might be that he is he's reflecting on his sin with Bathsheba. So we would think in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 12, as David is confronted by the prophet Nathan of that said sin. The sin of adultery and the sin of murder with Bathsheba. And so we notice in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13, 
As David is confronted by the prophet Nathan, and he says, I am that man. He is the one that is in sin. He understands that he is in sin. David says this. And David said, in, uh, David said it to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, and thou shalt not die. Now, did you notice that as David confessed his sin, and as David is reflecting on his sin in the psalm, there is the awesome element of God's mercy entwined in this. No matter where you go in the Bible, no matter what word you look at in the Bible, no matter what chapter you look at in the Bible, whether you're looking at Genesis or Revelation or all through the Holy Scripture, you will see that it is entwined with God's grace. His hand was heavy upon David. And I thank God for his heavy hand on us. I thank God for his conviction in our lives when we sin. I thank the Lord for that. Because any time God would be justified to say, David, bye. Off the face of the earth. Larry Stevens, bye. And we have sin festering in our lives. And we know the Lord is convicting us of that. To get out of that lifestyle. It is as if our body is wasting away. His bones have been waxed old, and he has, he has gone to the place where his bones feel like they are wearing out. Maybe one of the reasons that we don't have true, what we would call happiness, or, or contentment, or a joy in the walk of the Lord, is that there is some sin there. We're harboring some sin, and we don't want to relinquish that. Maybe that's the reason that we can't be happy. Maybe that's the reason we don't have joy in our life, is that we're holding on to something. Remember, we'll either pray judgmentally, I will pray selfishly when there is sin. We need to know that there is a confession. And when we confess to the Lord, He is faithful, He is just. There's a reason that His hand is heavy upon us about something. He wants, He wants to reason and forgive us. There's a reason that His hand is heavy upon us. It is because of His grace. I would say it is a dangerous path, any way you look at it, to continue in sin. We are on dangerous waters. Now, if we don't know Jesus, of course, we are already dead. We're dead men walking if we don't know the Lord Jesus. But if, if we know the Lord Jesus today, at any time the Lord could say, I've had enough and take us out of this world that we live in. If we continue to harbor sin at any moment, even, even in that it is God's grace. It could take us on out. Even that is God's grace. Instead of letting us go on and continue to walk straight to hell, He grabs us and takes us on. Even in that, there's God's grace. Any way you look at it, it is dangerous to be in opposition to God. And true joy, I would say, only comes through a clean heart and conscience towards, towards God. And I've talked with many people who were unbelievers. They didn't even believe in the Lord. They, were just to, they, were, they claimed to be atheists. And they said, I don't believe in the, in the Lord. But yet I'm happy. I'm happy. We're happy. And after you talk to them for a little while, and as you dig a little bit, and you, you just get to know them, you, you, you come to find out that this happiness that they have is a superficial happiness. It is, is a happiness that they have conjured up in their own life to make themselves happy with their decision that there is no God. They have tried to justify some way that there is no God. I, I'm, I'm happy, look at me. And you'll find out that it's canned happiness, if there is a such thing. A happiness that comes in a can. They've conjured this up. they boxed this up. It's superficial. It is not true joy. It is not true peace. It is not true contentment. They have conjured this up to justify their own actions, to convince themselves, yeah, I can live without God. And the reality of it is, is that we are most miserable without having the Lord Jesus at the center of our life. Now, see, the word that David uses here is waxed. In the King James, it uses the word wax, which just simply denotes that his bones were worn out. It felt as if the man was a hundred years old. It felt as if he was, he was on, up in age when he was uh, more, more uh, than likely not very, not very old. He is spiritually and he is physically depe depleted because of the sin that has left in his life. As he reflects, he recalls the time where this sin has really depleted him both physically and also spiritually as well. But see, we see the mercy of God through it all. We see the mercy of God through it all. It is a joy to know, as the hand is heavy upon David, for me it is an, it is, it's a joy. And for you it should be a joy as well to know 
that when you are in opposition to God and that his hand is heavy upon you, that should be a joy to you because that ultimately says to the human being that he loves us. That he loves us and takes the time to invest in our lives by sending his only precious son. His hand is heavy upon us because he loves us. It is a joy to know that when we are in opposition to God, his hand is heavy upon us. It is for this cause right here that the world, the one that doesn't say, that says there is no God. It is for this cause right here. The hand is heavy upon them and they know this. They continually try to push this heavy hand off of them. They spend their life, literally their life's blood, trying to refute God. Because his hand is heavy upon them and they deny it. As Paul says in Romans, they have suppressed the truth that they already know. God's hand heavy upon them. And so they continually push back against God. David is describing a spiritually and a physical drought. When one has sin festering in their life, it not only takes a toll physically or spiritually, but it also takes a toll uh, physically as well. You become worn out. You become depressed. You become on all types of different medication because you can't deal with your, your anxiety or, or whatever it may be. And you, you might be in deep depression because sin has allowed to express itself in your body in a physical way. Much like what David says. His inner man was much like a desert. It was dry, it was dusty, and it was barren. Can we say that this morning, that we are spiritually vibrant? That our sin is ever before the Lord and we have confessed our sin? Or can we say this morning, or do we say this morning, yeah, I feel as if I am spiritually dry. I feel as if I am dusty inside and I'm just not bearing any fruit at all. To effectively pray for the harvest, one must know that true happiness that only God himself can bring. We have been forgiven, which yields forgiveness. Our forgiveness yields happiness. And because of that, we can effectively pray for the harvest. And number three, praying for the harvest involves seeking God wholeheartedly. Now, I understand at the beginning of this particular truth that we do this in every area of our search uh, for uh, to be a great disciple for the Lord. In trying to be a good disciple for the Lord Jesus Christ and following Him and doing the best we can under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and begin to have an active life of discipleship, we do this in all areas of our life. But here we want to focus in on the harvest and the laborers that come because we pray for the harvest with clean hands, clean heart, true happiness. Praying for the harvest involves seeking God wholeheartedly. And so this is what David says in verse 5. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. I said I will confess my transgression before the Lord and thou uh, forgive the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come nigh unto him. See, David here acknowledges his sin before God. It almost makes me think of the very fundamental um, element of salvation. It almost makes me think that David is expressing what we call in the, in the vacation Bible school the ABCs of salvation. Very basic, but also very deep. He acknowledged his sin before God in which there is no hiding. You know we can't hide anything from the Lord, but sometimes we think we can you know how I many I would run into somebody and they would try to hide because they're doing something they're not supposed to do? Or you run into something and you, know, and you try to hide because you know you're, you're doing something that you're not supposed to do. We think that we can hide our deepest and our darkest secrets from God, which is an offense to Him. Why is it that us as human beings fear man before we fear God? You ain't got to hide things from me. You don't have to hide things from me in your life. You need to be worrying about the one who can see all. Worrying about the Lord as he can see things. And it makes me think of this book, and I recall the, the title of it, is When God is Small and People Are Big. We have a big view of one another. We, want, we don't want to offend one another that we can see right here and now. But when it comes to the things of God, we try, to, we try to hide things from one another. We try to hide things from one another. We don't care if God sees it. Maybe it's like this. We could come to church and we say that we believe in the Lord Jesus. 
We say that we trust the word of the Lord. We, we hear sermon after sermon. We hear sermon on sin. We hear sermon on, on, uh, on missions. And these are, hard, these are hard. These are hard realities. And we hear them week after week. And we know that we are an offense to God. We walk out. We shake our heads and say, yes, I agree with your preacher. But we walk out here and act like God is not even there. Like water on a duck's back. And here's the problem I have with that is because we're practicing like we don't believe God. We're practicing like we don't believe God is there looking at us. In reality, He is. He loves us. He wants to see us prosper. There, there's a reason why His hand is heavy upon us. He loves us. So why is it that we think that we are better off hiding things from one another and that we're wide open with, with God? Because we really are. We're wide open to God. And so David here, he says that he cannot hide his sin before God. And really, it is an offense to God to try to hide things from Him. It really says that we don't understand who He is. It really says that we don't understand the attributes of God. It tells me, and it should tell you, that if we think that we can hide things from God, we don't understand who He is. We haven't understood the deep theology of who God is in the Bible. It seems like many times we are worried about what the preacher might think or what our fellow Christian might think over what God definitely sees. One person would come in church and they raise their hand and say, Hallelujah. Amen. How many heads turn? How many heads turn to look and see who that is? Or how many times do we not praise the Lord because we're worried about what our fellow man might think of us? How many times when the invitation goes forward or the response time, the preacher was preaching on sin, and if I come forward, I'm going to be examined as I'm coming down. They're going to be wondering. They're going to have a little group and wonder what sin they're, in, they're engrossed in and entrapped in. We're wondering what, they, what sin did they commit. When all actuality, when one comes down to confess their sin before God, we rally around them and pray with them. We, put our, we lay our hands, we pray, we bear their burden. But how many times would he examine them and say, well, ah, we're all guilty of this. And David says this, my sin I acknowledge to you, my iniquity I did hide. I said I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. In God's good mercy, he forgives one that confesses their sin to him. Now the Hebrew expression, I want to pick up on this just a few minutes. Just bear with me and then I'll close. On the word confess. When we confess our sin, I want us to pick up on this before we dismiss Confession in the Hebrew language has a very deep meaning because confession denotes an act of worship. When we confess our sin, it denotes an act of worship because now we are acknowledging that we are in sin and that we are in sin and opposed to the most high God over all the universe. Confession in the language gives the expression that we have one's hands reached towards the heavens as an expression of our heart reaching toward the heaven. And we are reaching out to God and acknowledging our sin in an act of worship to Him. It also denotes the wringing of the hands. It denotes one that is wringing of the hands because they are in deep sorrow and lament that they have offended God. Confession is worshiping God and it is also lamenting that you are a sinner in the eyes of the Lord. And there will come a time when God will judge this world so there is an urgency today to pray for the harvest. And a recap, praying for the harvest involves forgiveness. We will not pray with the right mode. We will not pray with the right mindset. We will not pray with the, the, with the right motive as a church body if we have not gave it to the Lord and confessed our sin. And only as we have been forgiven will it bring true happiness and, and, uh, and joy. So praying for the harvest involves happiness and then lastly, praying for the harvest involves God seeking wholeheartedly. So I knelt to pray, but not for long. I had much too much to do. I had to hurry and get to work for bills would soon be due. So I knelt and I said a hurried prayer and jumped up off my knees. My Christian duty was now done. My soul could rest at ease. All day long I had no time to spread a word of cheer no time to speak of Christ to friends. They'd laugh at me, I'd fear. No time, no time, too much to do. 
there was a constant cry. No time to give my soul in need, but at last a time to die. I went before the Lord, I came, I stood with downcast eyes. For in his hands God held a book. It was the book of life. God looked into this book and said, Your name I cannot find. I once was going to write it down, but never found the time. Now, we know the Lord is sovereign in all of his ways, and he writes those who, know, he, who trust him from the foundations of the world. We know that God is sovereign, and he, the name is written down. He knows it. I mean, taking him by surprise, like God accidentally wrote a name and had to erase it. What if God was like us in our commitment? What if God was like us in time of commitment? We don't commit our time in prayer. What if God was like that? But see, he is not. He's waiting for you today. He's waiting for you to confess and be forgiven through the Lord Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of forgiveness. Today is the day that we begin to pray. We begin to pray for the harvest. Would you bow with me and pray?